Hey there. Bob from Oregon's Constant Gardener. It's Saturday. Just hanging out on the old uh, patio here, having a little coffee before I start my day. Feel fall coming on. A little chill in the air. What are you up to today? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, the reason I'm here is because uh, during the week we usually do, you know, just the five shows. But this week, uh, Mark Irvin stopped by unexpectedly. He was, uh, you probably saw him on Wednesday on the show, did the uh, spare bedroom garden thing. But Mark is a fascinating guy. Uh, we've talked to him before, but... Um, this was uh, I wanted to have a, like a little more longer type interview with him and talk about some other stuff because he's a he actually started off in archaeology and uh, studied ancient ag ancient agriculture so he's got a real nifty take on uh, the whole history of agriculture back from uh, you know digging in the dirt with a stick clear up to what we got going now so I thought that'd be interesting he's got a unique uh, take on how things are so I did an interview with him it's like 30 minutes long but it's good stuff so you know go ahead and watch that. And, uh, you know, I'll catch you on Monday. I love you. Hey there, Bob from Oregon's Constant Gardener. Mark from Green Grow. Howdy. What's going on, Mark? Irvin from Green Grow. It's Irvin, right? Irvin. Yeah. Because <laughs> Gork is always, he's like, oh, it's Irving. Irving, Irvin. It's somewhat, Irwin. Irwin. Something like that. Ewing, I don't know. It's, it's everything. Uh, all right, so... I guess the thing I wanted to talk to you about is you, uh, well, tell us your background, but I, the thing I was saying is that, that you've uh, studied uh, ancient agriculture through being an archaeologist, just yeah. how you kind of got started and, and they yeah. kind of turned you around. So just briefly, what is that background? How did that all go? Yeah, well, um, studied University of California in Santa Barbara, studied agricultural, um, well, Archaeology and then ancient agricultural practices um, through archaeology and mm -hmm. uh, cultural anthropology. So, kind of a mixture of, of the two and how ancient cultures approached the concept of agriculture is really more what it is, what I studied. And that was my focus uh, in archaeology. So, yeah. So, that's why I, I just, I've been curious about this. Maybe other people are, maybe just me. But uh, did people start eating meat, do you think? And then, you know, I mean, all, we don't know, right? We don't know what happened back then, but you have some theories. You probably have some theories. What are your theories? Do you think people started eating meat first or vegetables? Well, I think, uh, I think that the, the first people that um, occupied land were hunter gatherers. So, they're mm -hmm. going to be foraging for food. They're going to be hunting to kill animals, but they're that was only a small part of their diet. They would be foraging for nuts and berries and tubers and mm -hmm. and, and vegetables, you know, it's opportunistically, I right? Gotcha. You're out hunting, you see a berry tree. I could use a little break. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and typically, you know, you had two subsets. You had, in, in the groups, you had the hunters and you had the gatherers. And sometimes they would opportunistically do both depending on like uh -huh. what they saw. So like, you know, you had you know, typically back then you had women that would go out and they'd, they'd look for tubers. They knew they were really specialized in how uh -huh. they knew what to look for. It was kind of training, you know? I got gotcha. And so they'd go out getting tubers and if they found a certain type of um, a protein insect that they would eat or like a, you know, a snake or whatever they could capture that would uh -huh. help the whole group, the whole sure. clan, the whole tribe, uh -huh. they would do that. And then the hunters, of course, if they're hold up in a berry patch trying to hunt you know yeah a bison or you know something uh -huh. like that uh -huh. of course they're going to have somebody collecting the berries right there you sure know, they're opportunistic but uh -huh. i think what happened was is that the question is is it when did agriculture start becoming the norm and hunter gathering stop becoming the norm mm -hmm. and why did that happen so, so do you suppose they like they realize there's more food here and they started staying more toward there and then they maybe observed some practices or how did it all do you think it started to actually start to realize that you could cultivate food perhaps well obviously these are all theories so i don't mm -hmm. want anyone yelling at me on instagram yeah. or twitter but <laughs> basically what we've studied a couple different ideas one they were tired of moving from place to place they usually uh -huh. would have like a summer winter camp and then like a uh -huh. spring fall or you uh -huh. know maybe they were just tired of moving one to another to the other to the other to find enough food for the year sure and they had maybe perceived that if they dropped the seeds of say you know a strawberry or, or, uh -huh. or 
or maze uh-huh. that it would grow if, 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 if it was near a stream or a river. So then, you know, they'd perceive that water mm-hmm. and the seed being planted and then you could control how it's grown. Okay. That's one theory. One, another mm-hmm. theory would be that there was a cataclysm or massive environmental change that made it so that hunter gathering just wasn't working for their civilization anymore. risk reward or maybe just so you just it was so arduous it was so arduous and just you know it just wasn't working and that they knew the concepts of that they could plant seeds and it would grow but it just wasn't ever useful to them until mm-hmm. now when they just gone through a huge calamity you know it could be mm-hmm. climate change a flood um, you name it you know gotcha. and uh, drought you know whatever um, so that spurred them into staying in one location to tend after that crop mm-hmm. and and by tending after that crop they started learning the process of agriculture now the other theory which is you know again people don't really want to talk about very often is that there might have been a much more advanced civilization that taught them techniques of agriculture and city building and things like that uh-huh. so they were hunter gatherers and they were foraging and traveling for long enough periods of time that they ran into a more sophisticated civilization mm-hmm. or maybe even a civilization that came that uh, passed through the solar system that came uh-huh. here for a number of years hundred years thousand years and then uh-huh. took off but in many cases we think that there might have been just a more advanced a, t- a tremendously more advanced human population that may have been wiped out. So a lost civilization or a transient civilization that, that came through. Yes. And that we see no evidence of them. Maybe they were on the tail end of their civilization and... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's likely that it could have been a civilization collapse. We think that potentially there's a possibility that there's also... Um, the reason why food became so scarce for the hunter-gatherers is because there was a calamity that happened on the planet because of this oh, high-tech civilization, you know? I got you. A nuclear war that created a nuclear winter or, uh-huh. you know, some type of um, event where maybe an asteroid hit and the, that advanced mm-hmm. civilization was like, we're out of here, we're taking off. Uh-huh. And then, so the climatic shift happened so they could... They could come across that society or evidence that society and either learn from what they found or oh, okay. they find remnants of that society in terms of people that stayed behind and they taught them some higher advanced techniques. Perhaps that, like uh, maybe there was a war now and someone in some tribe in the Amazon survives it because of where they are. That'd be exactly how uh, it would be. Uh-huh. And like, so like say there was a nuclear war and all of America was wiped out, but like maybe a few thousand people uh-huh. and the people from an indigenous population somewhere in the rainforest that had never made contact Mm -hmm. made contact with us and Mm -hmm. then we showed them some of our ways i mean that a lot of people don't like that theory Uh because it goes out of their comfort zone sure and it's considered forbidden archaeology in the texts but it's not to be overlooked because now that we're unturning every stone we're finding that things aren't as clean as we want them to be with archaeology um, you know, agriculture, we've been pushing the envelope the last 25 years, we've been pushing the envelope on when did agriculture start. Uh-huh. 6,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, we have some evidence now showing 10,000 years ago, uh-huh. um, you know, in the Indus Valley and the Sumerian regions. Um, we have some spots in Central and Southern America that show that there were some types of early forms of agriculture. So, so the, the more we learn, the more we can see. The, the, it's like, you know, the, the, how, how long people have been in America. It seemed like it was, well, it's a few thousand years. Well, it's 6,000 years. Well, it's 16,000 years. It's tw- the, 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 we find more evidence. That, that, yeah. So, but as far as like that it was some sort of advanced culture that, that passed that down that's either lost or transitory, is there any evidence beyond logic and conjecture? that that's what happened well you know i think we're starting to find more out about how our earth has changed and what caused that change i mean obviously we're on a 22 degree axis ish Mm -hmm. and Uh you know we're on a tilt and we're thinking that maybe it wasn't always tilted so maybe there was like um something that happened you know a few hundred thousand years ago or maybe even less that like maybe astronomers think maybe a, a rogue planet or something went through our solar system that caused you know, With gravity even might not have hit, it hit us. It just was so close that it. Yeah, a gravitational shift. So the Earth tilted 22 degrees, and uh-huh. what happens to a bowl of water when you tilt it 22 degrees, right? So that's where these kind of flash floods and flash freeze events could happen. Because uh-huh. if you think about it, you look at the Earth. We're 
Antarctica is right now, it's towards the bottom, not all the way, but towards the bottom. Yeah. If you tilted that 22 and a half degrees this way, it's a lot of Antarctica is in a temperate zone mm -hmm. that could grow agriculture. Well, is it more logical that our planet would be straight up 90 degrees to the sun? I mean, and, and I mean, that seems to make sense that we wouldn't be tilted. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't think that we had always been tilted. I think mm -hmm. there was a different, you know, we had totally different epochs throughout the last couple million years, you know, of like times when there was so much CO2 in the atmosphere that plants were, dandelions were 20 feet tall, you mm -hmm. know? So like we talk about global warming. Well, we've had global warming happen to this planet over and over again in the last millions of years. You sure. Know? But what caused this sudden climactic change where everyone stopped hunter, I mean, they didn't, everyone didn't mm -hmm. stop, but everyone started taking a hard look at hunter-gathering lifestyles and, uh -huh. and then that's when we saw civilization pop out you know like between 10 to 12 thousand years ago at least and we think it could have gone a little bit further back but okay. every culture has a uh, oral tradition of a massive flood or climactic uh -huh. thing that happened like the sky uh -huh. shook and then bad things happened or the sky shook and then the water re rose really high or the sky shook and then we had to move to a different continent basically <laughs> uh, uh, uh. so i mean you know i think my personal theory from all my studying is is that maybe antarctica was once uh, an area where agriculture may have started uh -huh. maybe it could have been 25 to 50,000 years ago and there was a more advanced um human culture uh -huh. there uh -huh. and that they were just pompeyed you know what I mean? Uh -huh. and they were Pompeii in the way that Pompeii was, everyone was covered instantly in ash, right? Uh, and flash done. frozen, right? Uh -huh. Antarctica has a mile to two miles thick of ice on it, which uh -huh. it doesn't have that all over it, but it has it in an area where you're like, what the heck? What it hasn't here? snowed this much in that amount There's of time. There's not enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So what we think is maybe the earth tilted, it caused a flood regionally in many parts of the world, if not the whole world, and then in valleys completely or they were glacial or some sort of mm -hmm. and it also caused the um the sunlight to not be able to shine very well for a number of years and the it flash oh, froze and the water on top of antarctica so uh -huh. you may have had cultures or an advanced culture down there that was doing agriculture and when this massive event happened most of them were probably wiped out or uh -huh. they're flash frozen or all that ice we uh -huh. don't know maybe uh -huh. and then they they went the survivors went to like the, the the regions of the world where we believe that you know agriculture and civilization arose from because uh -huh. all of a sudden it's just like in, in human geologic time it's just like overnight within a hundred years these people had uh -huh. agriculture or they had uh -huh. systems in place like sewer systems and you know and, and streets much and, more than just uh row yeah. crops it was <laughs> yeah and so uh -huh. you know we're th you know the egyptians had some of that going on the phoenicians were a precursor to the egyptians uh -huh. Um, you know, you had Sumer, the Indus Valley, um, those regions. And if you think about it, you know, you're, you're getting away from Antarctica as fast as possible in a boat or whatever you had. You can, yeah. Uh -huh. And you're going to go to an area that was exactly a similar climate or a temperate climate, you uh -huh. know? And when people believe that within the last 20,000 years, um, the Egyptian valleys there, uh -huh. and in really northern Africa, used to be more of a um, grassland savanna. Okay, sure. So there's uh -huh. there's a lot of evidence to prove that. So uh -huh. we believe that that's where they would have gone, and Indus and Sumer and places like that, mm -hmm. and you know, or they just discovered those agricultural techniques over time and place. I mean, but those are the areas where it started, and those are the areas where they finally settled down, uh -huh. and built city structures, built townships built society around agriculture. Agriculture was the cornerstone of society in those days. So, because we, we have hunter-gatherers still, they're the lions, tigers, and bears, and you see them, and, and most of their time is conserving energy, mm -hmm. where when you see an agricultural society, it's about working all the time, you need more people. So, do you think that, that gathering together made people need to do agriculture, or because they needed to do agriculture, they started to move together and build cities? Well, I just think that, you know, their populations started growing and they couldn't be sustained on f hunting and gathering uh -huh. you know these once you get over a certain threshold of people it's almost like a magic number you need to start doing agriculture to because you can't walk far enough to 
to you go can't walk far enough and if you're a chief or a chieftain or whatever uh -huh. that's your currency at that point uh, i'll okay. give you this much grain if you go and do this mm -hmm. work for me if you go put this shield on and go fight those guys that are having, causing problems to us we're going to take care of your family and that was the currency so a feudal type society kind of thing mm -hmm. builds up yeah so that was the initial stages i think and you know so from those early stages that's why we're like some of the you know the technology that green has been trying to harness is ancient agriculture is because uh -huh. you know how do you just all of a sudden have an agricultural practice that works tremendously well back in the day to support yeah. the egyptian population uh -huh. the sumerians the aztecs the mayans like these weren't small play like the mayan culture copan and chichen itza they had a hundred thousand people wow. in those regions uh -huh. in or in that city state uh -huh. that's such a tremendous that's a that would take somebody a, a really good agronomist today a really good agricultural expert today to be able to map that out plan it out and make sure that people are fed so they had sophisticated sure. systems that you shouldn't have you shouldn't have had those systems that it makes ago. no sense to, to jump that far ahead especially if you went from having bows and arrows and sticks and hunter gathering and then within a thousand years or less you have all these sophisticated systems wow. it's just so we don't know how or when or why, but we do know what, right? We know what they did, to the, what their practices were to some extent. To some extent. How do those differ? I mean, the very most ancient things that we can see, what their techniques and stuff were, how do those differ from not what we're doing now, but what we were doing 100 years ago? Well, you know, I think we we keep rediscovering things every few hundred years that we didn't think that our grandfathers and people knew, uh -huh. right? But what we want to try to get away from is the last 75 years of agriculture right and that's yeah. getting past that is where we have usable information of things uh -huh. that, that work that are sustainable but uh -huh. like egyptians for example this is an archaic way of saying it but a flood and drain system okay so they would build their fields a certain way so that when the nile flooded every year uh -huh. they would flood down and then it would receive back, right? And so it would flood, and that would help them get like their fertile soil, their fertile topsoil from the river mm -hmm. once the river receded. And then it also get get, get their their water loads, was, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then it'd go away. And sometimes it, it would flood even when the crops are in the ground just a little bit, and then go back. And so it's a really arcane way of looking at a flood and drain system because. Uh -huh. The flooding is bringing nutrients from the river, uh -huh. and the draining away is, is taking away so you, buildup of salt or whatever could be there, you know? Uh -huh. And also that it's dry enough that you can, you can plant some exactly. stuff there. So there's that way. And then um, the Mayan uh, and Aztec systems, there's some cool things called, um, they have these, um, they're, they're mound systems that have moats around them. So uh -huh. they look like, you draw a circle uh -huh. and you draw a line going down. Okay. Right? The, like the male symbol, pretty much. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you fill the trough systems with water, right? Okay. Uh -huh. And the plants are in this rich soil and the roots go down and the flood system goes down the alley and goes around the circle and that circle saturates the, the soil zone below while the mound stays dry above. It's like with your prop trays, where you you mm -hmm. fill it up there and then you pour it out, and the the water goes up into the into the, the plant. It's, it's very similar it's, to that. Yeah. Sub irrigated soil, uh -huh. I mean, yeah. which is now a big deal. And now in greenhouses, people are going sub irrigated. You know, really. Uh -huh. So I mean, we're we're just taking technology and, and making it more sophisticated nowadays. Uh -huh. That like they just did out of necessity. Do you think so, so? I guess I would assume that, that composting was probably something that they accidentally discovered by throwing all their food scraps into one pile and something grew there that kind of thing they were they were pretty adept at knowing what compost was back uh -huh. in the day and there's actually some references in the bible um, about using um, compost and manures or yeah. composted manure uh -huh. so you know it, somewhere in the bible it talks in the new testament about like an olive tree wouldn't grow so how would they fix that and uh -huh. one of the guys was like well you take some of the composted dung from this animal uh -huh. will spread it around the, the soil in this fashion uh -huh. and then we'll water it and then next season I guarantee there'll be olives there and next season there was olives there so you have some of these interesting I mean and that was 2,000 2100 years ago almost so like 
even yeah. even that's a glimpse into what they were doing back then. They knew then to grow olive orchards, you had to mulch the soil around it mm -hmm. with composted manure mm -hmm. and and water it and and make sure that it was it was properly taken care of. So, so seventy five years ago. Well, I guess, you know, we kind of had to do something to feed everyone because there was a population started growing rapidly. So, and we, we look back at it as a mistake now, but was, did we, was the modern agriculture built on the shoulders of ancient and, you know, semi-modern agriculture, or was it a departure from that? It was a departure in the way that, you know, we had just gone through two really tough wars and we had a lot of bomb making material left over. Mm -hmm. A lot of the bomb making material, ammonia nitrate, you know, calcium nitrate, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other crap, you know, uh -huh. um, and you know, that went into um, feeding the soil, mm -hmm. feeding the plants. It's a liquid, it's a powder, it can go down your irrigation lines. The farmers don't have to amend each row, they don't have to do this and that, it's less work, you sure. know, and it worked, you know, you, you hit your plant with ammonia nitrate. <laughs> It goes you know, nuts. Yeah, it, yeah. There you go. I mean, it goes nuts. So, uh -huh. um, you know, we we had a huge departure around the World War II era into um, liquid synthetic fertilizers, mm -hmm. and the problem was is it solved a, a solution of being able to stabilize the population and grow a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Problem is, is it destroyed our soils. Yeah. And you know, before that though, they had also had problems with by destroying their soils because. They, they were stuck, they went from doing polycropping, which they had, their ancestors had told them to do, uh -huh. to monocropping corn and wheat and cotton over and over and over and over again, which caused the dust bowl. So was that a, a government thing, a money thing? Uh, uh, yeah, because certain crops were federally subsidized. And so you'd pull out the other stuff and you put in the crop that was federally subsidized. It's make you more money. Well, not even making more money. Some people just couldn't make money growing what they were growing. To this day, corn is federally subsidized. You couldn't you couldn't make any money off of corn nowadays because people want to buy it for too cheap. Yeah, which is again why they're using chemical fertilizers. So, you know, so uh, corn won <laughs> to some extent. I mean, if, it, if you're looking at taking over the world, corn is in in almost everything. Well, if you did an isotopic analysis of your body, you are made up of probably about sixty percent corn. And that was not the case before no. corn became this. No, huge. and that's why there's can a lot of can a lot more prevalent cancers, a lot of mm -hmm. mineral mineral and vitamin deficiencies in humans nowadays. Like the mineral and vitamin loads for the for the average vegetables has dropped fifty percent over the last thirty years. Wow. So, and that they're probably another fifty percent before that. So, what do you attribute that? Just the synthetic fertilizers? Yeah, yeah I practices mean, tilling these sorts of things as well. Mean, or? You're, you're kill, you kill the soils. Uh -huh. So before there was a whole biological process in the soil, they would, they would dissolve the minerals, feed it to the plant, mm -hmm. as well as putting dung and manure and stuff down like the farmers would do, putting down compost, mm -hmm. which is biologically active. Mm -hmm. So all those things would, you know, would get the plant pop properly mineralized, right? So a lot of companies now are trying to remineralize the earth because we have, our agricultural areas are stripped of the minerals. They're just kind of like a, a nutrient sand, yeah. right? They're just your plant. If you go to the, all the grape fields and like the stuff in the Central Valley, it's literally just like this fluffy sand material, and you just plant in it and irrigate your liquid synthetics, and there you go. There's your almonds. There's your grapes. There's your whatever. You're 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 doing. It's you're hydroponically growing in its soil, basically. Yeah. You have a, and it, you have an inert uh, substrate that you're that you're growing in. Yeah. Wow. So, do you see things have changed over the last ten years? Are we are we making any progress? Mm, I think people are a lot more conscious of growing organically, but they don't know what that means. I think organic's a buzzword. Uh -huh. I think that people go to the local specialty food store where they sell organic produce and they uh -huh. just buy it because it says organic on it. They don't know why it's organic or what makes it organic. Mm -hmm. um, that's an education piece that we need to start talking about, uh -huh. and then. Um, I think that if you talk to anyone from big ag, they're just like, organics is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not cost effective. If you want us to move towards organics, we can do that right now, but your food your food costs are gonna go up. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they would also say that, that you couldn't feed the world organically because 
you the inputs to grow those plants are, are not available enough so but I, I guess our, our soil is is you know we've killed a lot of our agricultural type soil that's probably had an effect on our water or our air or everything yeah so is that fixable on a large scale I think with the right technology it is mm -hmm. I think that by slowly transitioning away from caustic chemical fertilizers and maybe having more purified mineral even if it's still thin synthetic but more purified mineral based fertilizers that mm -hmm. aren't causing toxic algae blooms in the rivers and mm -hmm. they don't have heavy metals right a lot of synthetic fertilizers have high heavy metals which mm -hmm. concentrate in the soil lead arsenic you know selenium whatever you want to say is it mm -hmm. mercury <laughs> i mean all that stuff you know um People, a lot of people are, are mining uh, stuff from like third world countries and they're mining stuff from places like China that don't have heavy metal guidelines. Oh, and they're wow. bringing those inputs over here, they're blending fertilizers with it and they're putting it out there into the, the land. And uh -huh. you know, you talk about mercury and lead from fish, well, your vegetables are coming out with that now because that's, you're using, that's the fertilizers you're using. So, I guess maybe we get there by growing our own food <laughs> and then that becomes the... Well, I think you slowly incorporate agricultural practices that are more organic and more uh -huh. sustainable and we get there over time. It's not like a, an abrupt line in the sand where you say, okay, we're just using organic fertilizers. I think we need to look at like where these things are derived from like because certain chemical fertilizers aren't necessarily that terrible. Mm -hmm. it's just a lot of them are. Yeah. So what doesn't kill the microbial life in the soil, let's start there. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we can start kind of picking and choosing what we use and what we can like start solubilizing ourselves because we can produce quadrillions of pounds of probably bacteria and mycelium and all those kind of things that can then eat organic matter to make things bioavailable. So we need to shift our focus on factories that we have is our bioreactors uh -huh. a big huge fertilizer factory gets turned into a bioreactor and all the solid waste or all of the you know animal parts or whatever we're not using uh -huh. that's going to a waste stream gets biodigested into clean usable fertilizers and you can have instantly available clean usable fertilizers like i can make ammonia right now for you uh -huh. a nitrogen source uh -huh. just by having biodigestation uh-huh you know ammonia is part of the process that bacteria put out mm -hmm. you talk about peeping and peeing and pooping well co2 and ammonia sure you know sure. so yeah. so would you would you go out and put um bacteria and fungi into our into our soil on a massive scale if you were in charge of the world is that what it is or and i then think not, that that would that would that would help just uh -huh. basically relaunching the bio the bioavailable bacteria and mycelium uh -huh. cycles in the soil would help and then i would i would probably want to look at you know our waste streams and how we can make sure that we use our waste streams properly to compost in the fields and to you know you have all these like animal feed lots and these like places where like steer manure is and horse mm -hmm. manure and chicken manure and stuff like that and it's like if you have a way to clean that stuff up and then amend it into the fields on a larger scale, uh -huh. you'd start bringing a carbon cycle back to the soil, which is what we're lacking. And the carbon cycle's stopped, and that's what we need to start back up again, you know? So biochars are a great example. So like, uh -huh. the right amount of biochar that's been inoculated you know, with compost or whatever else, uh -huh. that'd be a great way to start getting the soil back to life again. And then making sure that we're not hitting it with things that continually kill the micro population. So I would assume that if we were just all gone tomorrow, there were no more people, that the, the Great Plains would soon grass over mm -hmm. and then the forest would come back and it would go through. What are we doing through our practices that keep that from happening? Well, we're spraying a lot of chemicals. We're <laughs> Roundup. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people are using that all over their properties. And um, a, 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 it's also a beaten path. You know, a seed can't propagate on a a rocky soil or you know a treaded path you know okay. so or tills, rolling and yeah roads. I mean, right or yeah. roads and you know and tilling uh -huh. tilling upwells all 
hundreds of thousands of years of, bi- of biology uh-huh. and then just turns them upside down on their head. They're like, oh, what do I do now? Or are they uh, dead? You know? Yeah. So, uh-huh. And it also, you know, you have certain layers of things being produced and they, they can't really all coexist instantly at once and you just made sure. them all co- coexist at once. So and you mix it all up. The rototiller. Mm-hmm. That's the... So that low, the low till, it. the low till revolution is uh-huh. helpful because if you stop tilling tremendously and you kind of polycrop and you okay. use organic biological approaches, that's, those are ways to get us closer. It's not going to be overnight. It's a hundred year process, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Other people will say 20 years, but I'm going to say a hundred. But a lot of the things that we have that we associate with uh, cars, with hydrocarbons, with uh, ranching and those sorts of things. Uh, those are obviously detrimental to our air, but is it possible that that a lot of this is that we've just taken away the Earth's ability to help us by by destroying so much of our soil th- th- through farming? I think I think it's soil and plant life, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you could burn as much CO two as you want in the in the atmosphere from cars. Plants breathe CO two. Okay, so that's not the problem. The problem is is everything else that comes with it. Oh, furons and other types of combustible hydrocarbons, you know? And then on top of that, you have the fact that we're re- deforest deforestation of the world. So they've le- uh-huh. every year you have less and less and less and less carbon scrubbers. Uh-huh. So, yeah. So, yeah, solar's coming along a lot. Do you suppose that we're gonna have a situation where we're all driving electric cars and we are using a lot less ener- energy, we're burning a lot less hydrocarbons, and the things get better that way? I mean, if they can create um, like zero point energy machines, maybe. Uh-huh. So, but that that's not really even the answer, really. I mean, because that's what we look at is that you know we got to stop burning stuff. Either you need but, to create the most efficient solar cell that this planet's ever seen, mm-hmm. or you need to be able to pull energy from all around us at all times, right? Which is easy. There's background radiation around us at all times. Mm-hmm. So you want to reduce the carbon footprint. And you want to reduce our energy usage as a as a country. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't get us there. I don't think it's the soil. Is the I mean, doesn't that's not going to stop the soil from being upwelled? It's not going to stop the soil from being tilled and the carbon cycle from stopping. I mean, Mm -hmm. so I think even if you went to all electric cars, your soil needs to be maintained. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think too. From just kind of digging into this a little bit, so low till so you know i mean obviously it's difficult to, a no till thing situation is a very difficult way to, to do it on a massive scale is there a low till way that, to do this you think that, that that is sustainable for big agriculture to do no, that's a really tough i mean it's a tough question mm-hmm. i mean i've looked at it many different ways and i don't want to be on the side of big ag but i mean sometimes when i look at a field that's 150 acres uh-huh. no How else would you do it i mean you know, no with with low till you're barely even getting the weeds out of there because you don't want to. Yeah. You know. Uh huh. So, I think there's probably someone out there smart enough to figure out figure it out, and uh-huh. we'll get there soon. But for right now, low till is tough to do um, for sustaining the population because uh-huh. you want to keep your aisleways clear mm-hmm. of uh, uh, weed seeds and mm-hmm. weeds that are growing and um, pathogenic insects mm-hmm. that might hang out in the weeds and. There's a lot going on. I mean, so, so large, large yeah. scale ag. I mean, they're they're polycropping. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That that's just the way it is. If they're going to make it successful, right now most ag is monocropping, mm-hmm. monocropping where they have 200 acres of just corn and 200 acres of just tomatoes and 200 mm-hmm. acres of to, you know. So do you see your job, your place in this whole thing to create a movement on a small scale that makes it seem obvious to everyone someday that this is well how we have to do it. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to just influence the family mm-hmm. unit first and to say, hey, from a family perspective, you guys can do this in your backyard or in a spare bedroom mm-hmm. or somewhere that you have or your neighbor's house, you know, if you don't have the space. But, like, I can't affect the change of a $100 billion a year ag corporation. Mm-hmm. So I have to start with the friends and family approach and, and kind of get them on the right path. Cool. Yeah. So that's... That's that. That's that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in and talking with us. Yeah. You guys want more little tidbits of information? Find me at the Green Grow on Instagram or greengrow.mark if you want a more personalized approach. 
And then our new website is launched, uh, www.thegreengro.com. So, Very cool. thanks. All right. <laughs> okay, well that was interesting. What did you, uh, what y'all think of that? Let me know in the comments. Let's talk about it a little bit. And uh, otherwise, I'll just see you on Monday. I love you.